The spacesuits were the major opportunity for creative endeavor. Either that or your worst nightmare. It was a tough exterior and we'd have to use a knife or poke at it. Sometimes it becomes the sound mixer who has to sort of, you know, navigate that journey that can be about territory and ego. Hey, it's Kim Kylan back with another URSA exclusive and this time we're here with Mark Ulano and Petrushka Mierzwa. Really excited to have you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Mark and Petrushka are a husband and wife sound team who have made a lasting impact on the art of cinema audio since they began working together in the 1980s. Their credits span well over 100 film and TV projects and their contributions to the film Titanic in 1997 earned them an Oscar for Best Sound. They were especially busy this past award season, with two of their films receiving multiple nominations for sound. In part one of this interview, we dig into the challenges they faced recording sound on the set of Ad Astra. It's a very novelistic, uh, in internal kind of journey, and uh, my connection to the film's content really began when I met James Gray. Initially, mm -hmm. when we're, uh, they brought me in for an interview, I'm friends with the producer. We've done several movies together, uh, Anthony Katagas, and we spent 15 minutes talking about Arthur C. Clarke, who is the author of 2001 and 2010's his other frightening proposition, which was 2001 was that we are not alone in the universe, mm -hmm. but his other fearful was that we are. That we are, yeah. And that's what that's what's sort of central to this, layered on top of a kind of heart of darkness journey. Um, and also on top of that, a very um, strong continuity in James's films about father-son relationships. My dad was a pioneer. He sacrificed himself for the search for intelligent life. My dad was the program. And so there was this, this really wonderful connecting tissue with, with um, someone who I, I've come to really have deep affection and admiration for in terms of his, his art as a filmmaker, as yeah. James Gray. And so Ad Astra, and plus Brad is uh, someone, uh, this was our second project that was leading into our third project together, which would be Quentin's movie right after. Mm -hmm. and we had done in Glorious Bastards together before that, so there was a kind of a foundational connecting tissue that, yeah. that was really lovely because he was producing the film. That's right. With his company and he's in everything so and he wasn't like a producer in title, he was a hands-on producer. Yeah. So um, the filmmaking component of that which was very difficult because of all the physical aspects of a high-tech sci-fi space driven movie yeah. um, that involves spacesuits and floating in zero gravity and um, you know Confined uh, environments. Confined environments yes. and uh, uh, contrasted against the void of space, you know, you're just, you're dealing with a bunch of stuff with a director who's, who's sort of, his history has been more, um, you know, organic environments, not really, you know, thrust upon him the, the you know, the... The confines the, of space. Yeah, the burden of that kind of approach to making a movie, you know, because it's, oh. it demands all kinds of predetermination right. and... And well, yet, that is sometimes an obstacle to getting the best thing to happen. Well, speaking of predetermination, you know, you had so many heavy, very important themes that seemed to be layered. You had the father-son connection, the, the heart, I love that you mentioned heart of darkness, and yeah. you had this kind of very real human organic element set against the cold vastness of space. That's you know, right. Where do you start for well, planning? Well, <laughs> for me, um, there's first the layer of investing in the project and becoming immersed in the, the psychology of the project, which is the first read of the script for right. me. I shut everything else out. I sit alone in a room and I do it in one pass through. I want to go on the journey of the movie. I don't want to think about the physical, the technical, or any of the logistics. I want to be invested. In the story. In the story, yeah. in this, you know, and these characters as they've been imagined so far on the page. and. Then I'll go another pass through that script in a couple of days after I've let that sink in and do this, you know, intensive analysis of the gazillion questions that are going to be directed in every different way. You know, it's basically a fine tooth comb going through that. Mm -hmm. um, and then a third pass after that for a few days because I, I used to not do that, but that third pass, I'm always picking up crumbs that I left behind because right. I'm, I'm over invested in micro managing my, my perception. So. That leads to, in a show like this, an enormous amount of attempts, attempted preparation. Right. Um, and that's when my team came in. Patricia was very core to that, as was uh, Patrick Martins was our other boom operator on that. And 
That meant getting close, right, first and foremost, getting deeply involved in the suits. The spacesuits were, from the sound point of view, the major uh, uh, opportunity for creative endeavor, <laughs> for challenge, or yeah. either that or your worst nightmare, de depending right, on which day it was, on the, <laughs> on the day and what was going on. Um, and so, um, but coming from that first read, I had always kind of come from the place of wanting to play carefully with that contrast between all the organic nature of the physicality of confinement yes. of in, you know everybody's in, you know in space suits even when the actors were all working together they're in suits very often they were in helmets yeah. and so we had to deal with the fluent communication amongst them using the tools we were also using for capturing their performances and so how are we going to deal with these suits well the first thing is getting together with the suit people and the, the, there's a company that specializes in spacesuits for movies in Los Angeles. So these were not actual spacesuits. These were made for film out of a no. different material. They were made as if they were no. real. Okay. They weighed about no. 35 pounds. No. They had to be operational. And then, it's a mixed uh, bag yeah. is what it is. Some there of them were six layers. Six there were many, layers. many layers inside. Right. With, um, they had all the layers for the, the suit fabric. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very tough. Yeah. It was a tough exterior, and we'd have to use a knife or poke at it to, to get what we needed out of it. Yeah. But then they also had um, nylon uh, oh, like zippered suits so that they could take them out for washing. But these things weighed 35 pounds. They were heavy. The actors were in them. Plus cooling systems for the actors. I was just about to say they had really? cooling underwear. It was like a radiant floor heating, but it Water was, pump. you know, there are oh. tubes running through so that they did, could Did that make any cool. noise? What do you think? Uh, then, <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> no, we had... The underwear, yeah, the, not so much, but then yeah, they had cooling, cooling fans, oh, wow. fans inside cooling. of them. And then fans in the helmet because you can do a, a visor right. up and CGI it later, but the DP made a, mm. made a decision that he wanted to see everything. So there are these con... Mirrors. Vex, yeah. mirrors wow. everywhere. And then once they started breathing inside, it was over. So there was a fan right behind them. That's my first thought, you the know, with the, working with the spacesuits was, the, the initial thing I thought was, oh, that's great, because you can hide the mic anywhere in here. And then, you know, I didn't not think so about much. any of these other well, things. But let me, let me back up into that. So the prep side of that, also they have these things called Snoopy caps, which are basically right. um, recreations of the Russian Soyuz type right. of, Head, headgear that would be used inside and so they were making custom leather versions mm -hmm. of that for the actors and we were building stuff in there because mm -hmm. if you have an open mic and we would have we basically double and triple rig the suits on a regular basis between somebody maybe needing to take a helmet off or yeah. put a helmet on or the sound would be better if this actor was in this position on, and the suits were not solid mm -hmm. in terms they, they evolved and so every day was sort of this what's going to happen next kind of thing. And this is the one that stayed on top of that. Petrushka was phenomenal in maintaining, first of all, linkage with the wardrobe department, which was which in, so in a crucial. In well, she like has this. a degree in fashion from FITM, by the way. And oh, so her, her cross training in yeah. sound and wardrobe is an amazingly useful kind of thing because she knows the language, the tools, the, 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 the realm. Yes. Um, but layered with what we need to do. So she gets a kind of, generally, she gets a usually a kind of respect and acknowledgement because yeah. of that. But the, the fragility of the mm -hmm. situation in terms of the physical problems, um, and then maintaining with the guys regarding the fan control on and off, and all of that became, but uh, part of the prep was, because we had that sense and we knew what was coming in terms of broader strokes, um, I, I also engaged in some serious testing with tools that we wouldn't have had five, ten years ago. Right. Isotope was really significant in dealing with fan mitigation when, when we had to, you know, am I going to be able to make this work right. when I'm dealing with... The bigger problem was not so much the cooling fans because we turn those off for takes, but the fogging fans for the because mm. it's right here and it's right. built into the helmet and Interesting. Um, and so they were not they consistent. Were noisy. They yeah. were we worked hard to get them to be quieter type fans, but because of the breakdown at the personnel level, some of those some of those things that had been worked out were not 
not fulfilled. Not anymore. Not anymore. We, so you know, they were just happy to have stuff that they could put on camera, you know, and so. But that's interesting. Isotope was such a large part. Of, was well, it was it for you or, or for post or both? It's for the movie. I'm not using Isotope on the set, course, but I'm yeah. testing with Isotope in pre-production with what it sounds like with those fans oh, on okay. in the suit. And what, you know, there's a line you can't cross. Mm -hmm. The line keeps moving, <laughs> and that's to the benefit of movie making in, yeah. a, in a very important way. And it's it's one of the things that I think is essential for production people to be is involved constantly as as students to learn yes. what are the tools being applied in post production. You need to go to the Isotope seminars. You need to understand what is and isn't true about your tracks on the set because yeah. you might be causing delay or hold up for an unnecessary reason or you might be overconfident about something that's actually not not safe right. so if you don't know that in in, a, in, a, in in precise ways you're putting yourself and the production at risk so we went through all that process and continued and it was just a matter of, of maintaining every day every shot mm -hmm. some degree of oversight to the diversity of situ of circumstance yeah. So that's why there would be, you know, two or three mics in the suits and the helmets. Um, also, the intercom, the communication. There's a whole cue mix going mm -hmm. on, so the actors can fluently communicate with each other. The director yeah. can communicate with them while they're in those suits. Um, and on top of that, James, I, and this was really interesting, as a director, mm -hmm. did something that's really unusual. I'm used to being a source for music for on, on the set for actors, mm -hmm. for mood, you know, which goes back to the silent era. So, uh, and also for mood for the crew. James had a real need for what he was doing with this film for tempo and for pacing and, and, and vibe of the, the scenes from his perspective to have me running a, we had a playlist that we developed. He's listening to music during takes that no one else hears. The actors are not hearing it. Mm -hmm. It's not on the set. It's strictly for James. And he would look over to me and he'd go, you know, okay, I want, uh, you know, this Ligeti opera, this, you know, and this would happen 15, 20 seconds before we're about to roll. Mm -hmm. And, but it was like a, you know, this sort of, you know, tele telepathy thing between us. And it helped him um, as a director to always sort of try to keep that, that Kubrick-like, right. You know, there's this floating pace, emotional space. almost like a, a, a zero gravity psychologically, huh. is the only way I can describe it. He promised me that one day I could join him in his pursuits, that he'd come back for me. A rocket is named Cepheus, crew of the Space Com military personnel. This yeah. presents a kind of situation that's common on films, and, and what, what, what often happens is it turns into territorial issues between departments, mm -hmm. not, not infrequently sound in picture. And this situation where we had a rig was created to create lights actually going behind them in the windows, mm -hmm. and it was a mechanical rig. Uh, it's like a slingshot on a rail right. to have lights go Right, so it probably made some noise. Made a lot of noise. <laughs> it was a challenge in this regard, and it's a challenge sound mixers have frequently, and it's part of why it's important for us to evangelize the truly proportionate contribution we make in making movies. Right. Um, a decision was made out of hand, not inclusive of even the director, mm. to choose a way to do a thing that would impact capture the performance on the day. Mm. It, for a for an, an element that was that wanted. I, I, I resist being judgmental about elements because making movies is intrinsically about elements will f bump up against each other. You have competing elements. Sometimes it becomes the, the sound mixer mm -hmm. who has to sort of you know, navigate that journey that you know, be, can be about territory and ego. Yeah. I don't bring ego to the set. My, I have a big ego, but I, I channel it to the project. My ego is about making this really, really fulfill the director's intent right. and the director's intent channeled through the performance of the actors. That's my mission. I don't think that's more or less important. I just think it's an essential instrument in the orchestra. We can fix it later in sound. You can, and right. if it works for the movie, then that's great. I don't have a, you know, a negative about that bit. But we can do the same with image now. Yeah. 
Well, we heard and recently, we do often. Yeah. What was the? It was the uh, Game of Thrones sound mixer. I spoke to at CAS Awards where uh -huh. they they had a battle over a fan, basically, like that just ruined the take. And the director came up to him and said, "It's it's not personal, but it, it is cheaper to fix sound than it is to fix picture." Not so much anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's gotten so much cheaper. Here's a perfect example of that: the, the film Lim is the one with Russell Crowe and Anne Hathaway, Anne Hathaway. Yeah. Um, and Tom Tom Hooper directed it. Um, in pre-production, it's a unique turning point, basically, in our tool set because in that in that situation, Simon Hayes, the production yeah. mixer, just going to mention him, got together <laughs> with Tom Hooper and said, "You know, we've all not all of us, but many of us. I, I when I when I've done big tentpole pictures, uh, Iron Man, Iron Man." To we, we, or similar films to that, mm -hmm. we are going to have moments where we want to. We know we're going to be doing CGI in certain things. So, yeah. I've I've engaged and successfully in having certain scenes where we're going to have microphones in full view because we know they're going to be painted out for mm -hmm. other reasons. Uh, in Iron Man, for particular, suit. You know, so the suit's partially physically there, partially it gets created later as CGI, and so there are zones mm -hmm. where. That's going to be painted, and right. we're going to take advantage of that or collaborate on that with the visual effects people. But is that was a app that was an, a, an approach collaborated and decided upon in partnership with the director and the production to do it all the time every day. Wow! As a matter of course, for for several reasons. One, because they wanted to capture the performances live. Live, yeah. And so it would preempt all the pre-records that would have been otherwise necessary. Right. So there is a whole sort of compression of time and, and energy. Um, it would pre it would preclude an enormous amount of post-production because it's all happening there on the day on live. It would preclude a lot of issues that have to do with microphone placement and, and camera. Right. And it would preclude an enormous amount of engagement with the actors for because of these period costumes were intense. They were very thick. They have all kinds of issues to them. But if we were comfortable with the idea that when necessary, we're just going to remove the microphone as, through through computer. Yeah. We're not in that conversation. So I've done three movies with Russell. Russell is a fantastic filmmaker. He's an amazing performer, but he doesn't like to be messed with when he's in it. Mm. And then we were at BAFTA that year, and I, 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 I pigeonholed Tom Hooper on this, and I said, Tom, we really would like to know. You know, uh, are you? Uh, first of all, were you happy with making that decision? Because it was, a, it was yeah. a landmark decision, really. Absolutely. Um, and and he said it was, it was the best thing we we could have. It was so helpful. Uh -huh. And I said, do you have any sense of the outcome in terms of the financial aspect? And here's what he said. He said it was under four hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars for the total. It was less mm -hmm. than the craft services budget for the movie. <laughs> To do it because they didn't need to do it every time, every shot. Right. When they needed it, they did. When they didn't, they didn't. But it was it, it removed that discussion, and yeah. um, and it's gotten inexpensive enough. I did a I did a thing for for uh, Marvel a TV series. I did several episodes before leaving for um, uh, Hateful Eight, um, and they have on set visual effects people on everything on their TV mm -hmm. series and. and, and we were doing it on TV, and and it wasn't a big yeah. deal. They expected it. They were familiar with yeah, it. They yeah. do it on all their shows. That's interesting. And, and so, what used to be profoundly expensive has now become incredibly, wow. you know, it's and it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Moore's law. So something like this, why couldn't that mechanical light fixture be? Uh, well, you're asking a question <laughs> that only gets raised when right. you are collaborating in pre-production on such mm. things, when someone has sort of just. Fait accompli on the day, it's after the fact. It's yeah. too late. Someone has not considered that an important enough element to a consider, or b they have brought that to the situation yeah. um, under. Oh, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to solve this, and they're they're then they, they get so buried in what they think is the only solution, and it preempts the director of the even a consideration to it, think of any other departments. Yeah, it preempted the actor in the director's space. So, that so we count, you know, we worked hard with them to try and say if we could choreograph when and where and what would happen. Right. I, it made me mic more more proximity than I might have. Mm, um, not that yeah. that hurt the scene, but it was a little different than what it, I would have yeah, done otherwise. Right. Um, it was a little bit of a quieter scene, though, so that it's helps. an intimate yeah, scene, absolutely. and they're on a train, you know. Yeah. So 
there's things you can do and a little bit of, you know, as, you know, it worked out. Yeah. But it's that kind of thing. What do you do as, as, as the responsible party? Um, you engage. Yeah. You just never, you know, Galaxy Quest, never give up, never surrender, you know. You, 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 stay, you stay in the game. You stay respectful. Yeah. You make sure all the adults in the room are clear-eyed if there's a decision going down. Yeah. Um, you hope that that's in their muscle memory later, yeah. and that you know. Um, but you're not responsible for their choices after the fact. There's yeah. a, there's a, you know, there's a high. Pro we have some very highly dynamic personalities in the arts, and that yes. we collaborate with, as are our, we ourselves. Yeah. Um, and so you just you you work at making sure that the solutions um, are the best that you can with you do the best you can yeah. with the tools that you have. So, so how did you get through this scene? How did you make this scene I work? I made the scene work with the best way I could at the yeah. time. I, I engaged the guys to try and be you know choreograph their okay. their runs. The, the 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 grips and the electricians who were dealing with the run. Let's find out what the slowest it could be for it to work in the yeah. first place visually, and try and stay in that and, and dial that in so yeah. that we don't start getting over that. Uh, try to have it at its maximum distance from the proximity because when they first did it, it was like right, right up against right the there, rest. you know. So they, they backed it off three feet, you know, which isn't a lot, but it was something. Um, yeah. We we also listened to the beats and the dialogue and see if that that could somehow mm, yeah. be part of the, you know all those yeah. each one in of itself might not have been the uh, ultimate solution, but in the aggregate and, and sensitizing everybody yeah. to the issue. Um, you get everybody trying to be on their best game, yeah. knowing that we have a compromised situation here. Yeah. And that's what you do. Do you, Are there ever situations in something like this where you would talk to the director about maybe working with the score? You mentioned rhythm. Let's say that this motor has a rhythm, right? Yeah. That will be present. There's nothing you can do about it. Are, are you ever able to work with the composer even? Like, do they ever... Um, sometimes, I think about that. sometimes they are. You know, yeah. there have been times where the composers come down, or there's music. I'm, I'm sort of the first. I'm, the, I'm sort of the music producer on the set by default, <laughs> yeah. without title, yeah. very often because um, what used to be an absolute, you know, uh, uh, prerequisite for music on set. Mm. Um, the studio would always have a music supervisor who was on set to deal with the interface between the music its nature, how we're doing the playback, the actors, the, how the actors are performing if the music's happening and they're right. performing the music. Um, more and more and more, that doesn't happen. Hmm. Somebody doesn't show up or hasn't been engaged for that particular discipline. Yeah. And, and so I have a music background, so that, that helps a lot because yeah. I can speak in those terms with the, the music side of the thing. Um, but it's 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 really a matter of uh, you know it's a blend between anticipation. Music's a very specialized area. Yeah. I mean, there's 50 ways to skin that cat. Exactly. Are we doing a simple needle drop of an existing commercial thing, or yeah. is it? In Once Upon a Time, we have Leo singing live on the Hullabaloo set. Right. Yeah. Oh my God, he's choreographed. He's surrounded by choreography. He's singing. You yeah. know, and it's. You know, Leo's many wonderful things. And but in a situation like that, I feel like the, the musicality that comes to, to anyone's mind on set, it, it's very obvious, right? But in a situation like this scene in Ad Astra where it's not as musical and you, you mm -hmm. have like a rhythm, like a chugging. Ex except with James Gray. Because he okay. is very, very attuned to those issues. That's great. And I'm playing music in his head for the scenes yeah. every day, all the time. And so um, tempo. If tempo would have been a solution yeah. to this, like in terms of incorporating it into the score, if even. the mechanics would have been solved, you know, the bigger the bigger concept at the time was the the how we would construct the idea of the sound of the train. Mm -hmm. That was the more calming conversation, <laughs> if you will, about right, the like possibility the, of you know this not really damaging it. And the guys yeah. got better at doing the thing too cool. as we were, as we worked into it. They got a little bit better, and they. they Lots yeah. of, you know, silicone. They, and they were working it, you know. They, they hadn't been asked to consider anything other than camera right, right. by the person who <laughs> set them up. Well, like if but I, once it came on, clear on the set, they were working towards the project. That's awesome. Now, there's something else that we did that really mm -hmm. comes down to our boom operators. Mm -hmm. Here we're using Sank and CS3Es. Why? 
A, they have no proximity effect. Mm -hmm. B, they have incredible uh, off smooth off-axis rejection. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, an enormous amount of leverage in terms of mitigating the sound that's behind them mm -hmm. by, by miking in ways that minimize any of that being in the pattern. Right, so we could so some of, of it. Instead of instead of where we'd normally be, we were in much more raking straight, you know, and because mm -hmm. of the, as you can see, the, the shot scale, we had a lot of leeway because we were in super, you know, we were in chokers right. as the dominant, you know, we did, we did do a master, but it was, it was not a, you know, they're in a train, so the master alone in the train, and so, and it was only part of a train set. Right, right. So they couldn't get much bigger. <sighs> And that helped. Yeah. That helped maybe more uh -huh. than anything else was, you know, uh, angle of microphone. Interesting. So oh, also, goodness. how was it recording in an anechoic chamber? <laughs> it was, an, it was really like recording hard. in an anechoic chamber. It was really, really, really I hard. I went in one of those oh, for the it first was, time it was too. ever we recently. A, an amazing experience. I mean, there, no, it was great. It, it was, was like it was an anechoic chamber. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that was the operational. Well, but, we tried yeah. so hard the to. Yeah. to radio it because it's this huge space and right. the camera was in the other room they yeah. Were yeah. and we well, couldn't not only that, access it. Th there was a there was a, uh, a control room mm. if you remember the scene right. they're speaking and there are people the in there and they're in the glass on the other side so there had to be a live two way they had to hear him he had to hear them right but he you know how did we do that without him wearing anything you know so yeah. so there was all of this you know um, what seems like the simplest thing in the world not that complicated, but it was still like, you know, you had to do it. Yeah. So, I got to the scene now. Brad Pitt is bringing Tommy Lee out into the light, right? He's bringing him out of confinement into yeah. the void of space. And these are the actors wearing yeah. wires yes, on the stage. Yes. Yeah. With a, a long zip line from or one end to the other. Or wires, or sometimes they would be on like a rig that is almost like the bull in a, in a, in a West, you know, in a Texas bar, you know, but yeah. upside down. Or, right. You know, they had, they had, to, but it's mostly. Sort of a pinata rig a, yeah. a couple of times yeah. where they were just on pulleys. And so all these close ups we're seeing. Yes. That are being intercut with him just wildly flip flopping toward the ship, just trying to get his, his bearings there. Yep. He's he's wired the entire time oh, yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. What were some of the challenges you guys faced with that? Um, I mean, it's so physical. The path of his breathing, his mm. breath could be, you know, if he was in physical motion, mm. you couldn't count on where his head would be in relationships because there's just no room inside yeah. the helmet. So, so sometimes we had to double mic. Um, not this was sometimes we could use this, mm. sometimes we couldn't. And Brad, yeah. after a while, stopped doing Is that this. The, the B three or the? It, it, it was, it was uh, a, no. I was using a, a um, 60s? no. I was uh, yeah. I was using DPAs. Oh okay. Um, Sixty sixty ones. Okay. Uh, inside and actually DPA makes a boom mic, um, mm. and we bought about fifteen thousand dollars worth of them for the yeah. show we bought I think a dozen of them it was you know yeah. they're not cheap yeah. but um, in some shots I'm sure you couldn't have that because there would be an angle where you would just catch a little bit of it, well, or, it but would, it would have been practical no, they, they, but we, they, we use them as practical so that you could see, see them okay. except at a certain point when we transition to the next journey piece Brad didn't want to have that anymore so which meant that for the rest of the movie we couldn't have so, them so I had to approximate so with DPAs that were not the boom style, but right. the same mic capsule. Um, and so, but th we would mic, you know, we would have some down, yeah. collar based, and we would have some side, um, and it was a mixed bag of, yeah. of microphone placement in there, and it would really would be tied to what, what he was doing. Wow. Yeah, and, and they, he had several different suits. Yeah. So um, I tried, to, well, we bought a lot of microphones. We did. A lot because uh, he had several suits. Everybody had several suits, right. and so rather than derig everything, no time. I think yeah. the first time took forty-five minutes. Oh my god! No. To, and I'm sure the actors don't you, want to deal with that. It gets no. them out of well, their character. It just wasn't practical to yeah. try and re try to move your rigs from one set situation to another. Good. You had to build. We probably had like seventeen lobs that we bought just yeah. for the show. On and top then of my package, some of, that was yeah. totally separate from it, my. It was a story yeah. about not communicating between departments, and sometimes the wardrobe people would take the suits off to the cleaners, and I hadn't de-rigged them, so microphones were, were gone. Didn't know yeah. when they were coming back. Like it was just, it, it yeah, just um, interesting. 
it, it was challenging on every level. And then, the next movie, that total Completely opposite. Completely different. Which I would actually really like to segue into the next yeah, movie. Yeah, what do you we? think? Thanks for watching part one of this interview, which is sponsored by Ursa Straps. If you haven't already, make sure you hit like and subscribe to our channel. And be sure to look out for part two when we break down a couple scenes from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This is Kim Kyland signing off.